<laughs> so um, if anyone does want to use the raise hand button or unmute, I'm going to give you a chance to um, like verbally <laughs> ask me questions. Um, and then if we kind of slow down, I'll jump back into the chat. So does anyone want to volunteer and, and ask their question first? This is this is Mr. Mullis. Um, I had posted a question, and, and let me ex expand a little bit on the question or my concern or worry, and it was in regards to giving more and more virtual, I'm going to call it toys for the purpose of this question. You can see I'm a little bit biased here. Um, we'll drive them further away from the conventional text. And the reason I bring this in, I used to work in the legal field. Juries are so now expecting to see all this high-tech uh, technology being shown in their jury case to prove the case. And if they don't, they have a hard time believing it. So I've, I've seen how giving more technology can also be a very detrimental thing. Um, and I, and I know it's not, not a great analogy, but I, my fear is the students are so inured to always being in a virtual world with their phones as it is now it is virtually impossible, pardon the pun, to get them to read anything. They want to watch videos. They want to read a synopsis. They want to read a 28 te you know, character uh, uh, summary of whatever they're supposed to be studying. And that's my only fear with something like this, because I've used something similar. We had one where it was um, the, the uh, Shakespeare's Globe Theater, and it was a virtual reality world, which was kind of interesting, trying to get them to kind of understand and demystify Shakespeare somewhat, that this was a common person's place to go, you know, and, and invest in, in their basically television of the day. Um, but that, that's my own way. Have you, have you seen that kind of issue? And I, and I know this is your specialty, but have you seen that kind of reaction in the lower grades, not necessarily the college level, but in the secondary schools? Yeah, I think this is a great question. And, um, you know, my answer, first and foremost, is balance. So in the course that I was talking about, the Cyborg, the Cyborg Apocalypse course, you know, I teach seven literary texts, you know, E.M. Forrester's Machine Stops, uh, Do Andrews Dream of Electric Sheep, um, obviously Frankenstein. I teach a Margaret Atwood novel in that class. So students are engaging with, you know, seven literary texts and one <laughs> virtual reality application, right? So it is about balance. And I think a lot of us do this with all sorts of media, right? So you, if you are teaching, you know, Pride and Prejudice, you're going to show the movie version, right, as well. If you're teaching, um, if you're teaching a Shakespeare text, maybe you show the Simpsons cartoon that did the riff on it, right? A lot of people teach adaptations in order to have their students connect with the material. I think the problem is, is when you show a student an adaptation, whether it be a film, a TV show, or a virtual reality application, is you've got to then go back to the text, which you saw my students do in those final presentations, right? They're not just loosely creating an outline of what they know the story to Frankenstein to be because they've seen 3000 adaptations of Frankenstein over their lives, but instead they had to go back to the text and do deep close readings of a scene in order to remix it. And I think there's a lot of creative writing um, exercises that are similar to this, right? Like write the story of Frankenstein from Justine's perspective or from Elizabeth's perspective, right? That would be a great creative writing exercise that has nothing to do with technology, but that allows students to more deeply engage with the motivations of the characters and, and their stories uh, within a larger novel. That's what I'm really hoping to do here is just use the technology as a way to get them to return to the text and do the work of, of reading it even closer and being able to critique the adaptations that they've seen because now they know the original much better after engaging with it. I also use this as a conduit or a vehicle for group work because I genuinely believe that the goal of our humanities education really is to facilitate those conversations through diverse perspectives of a text. So when you have a group of four or five students working to produce or create something together, 
they're going to disagree on what happened in the text. They're going to disagree on what the characters should do. They're going to disagree on those representations in the media that they're producing. And that's the real work, right? That's the real work of the humanities is trying to have students have these debates about the text and having them like really have to grapple with the what is the essential nature of the text and the authorial intent versus reader response and all of that great stuff that we as as the as you know as the experts know but we want them to get there without using that kind of language and with having them just work together think through what they're going to build and create do the work of research and writing um, these new media objects i also do think that in terms of virtual reality, most of the experiences that we're talking about are, you know, 10 minutes or less. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the one I gave you, Lincoln and the Bardo, is 10 minutes. Um, many of them are very short immersions that you can do in the space of a, of a class versus like needing to spend three days watching a movie, right? <laughs> or some, you know, hours of, of content that's taking away from that time you're spending with the novel. These are very short immersions that, um, that you can easily kind of drop in to a lesson without spending too much time um, with the tech. Does that help? Absolutely. I see a hand from Kathy. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, at our school, we really only have Chromebooks and they can't have their phones out. So um, what are those kind of barriers to overcome? Yeah, absolutely. That. So as you heard, I just called the New York Times and had them send me the, um, you know, the Google Cardboards for free. Um, here's, your, here's where the biggest barrier in a high school level or below might be, and that's the smartphone. So I know that there are a lot of schools that don't allow smartphone phones in the classroom, don't allow students to use smartphones in the classroom for all sorts of important and good reasons. Obviously, at the college level, I don't have that. At the college level, you cannot get students to put their phones down. Amy will, I'm sure, um, echo that. Um, but Pew Research does say, the, the most recent research out of Pew says that at, from age 13 and older, 98% of students have access to a smartphone. So a couple of recommendations. Uh, I have a dear friend who teaches fifth grade. Again, fifth graders don't, aren't allowed to have smartphones in the classroom. What they've done is they've asked the parents to donate their old smartphones when they're done with them. So parents are getting an upgrade, they're getting the new iPhone, they're switching from Samsung to whatever, right? They're getting rid of their smartphones. We all know that smartphones generally only have about a two year shelf life, right? For most populations, it's planned obsolescence. So you ask for donations for old smartphones and you put them just on the on Wi Fi, no data plan, and download these free apps. You have a set of essentially what are, you know, garbage burner phones, right? In your classroom that are only used for this purpose. My friend teaches fifth grade that's been very effective. Every year she gets a couple of parents who are donating old, old phones over the course of, you know, three or four years, she now has 20 old smartphones that are only used on the Wi-Fi and only for these um, applications. You also do not need a device for every student. Like I said, I pair the students. So only one is in the headset and then one is not in the headset, helping the other uh, person who's in the headset at any given time, right? So in a class of 20, you might only need eight, right, devices that to make an exercise like this work. Um, and you can also ask permission to have like an hour of the day where students could bring in their smartphones and you can have them pre-download all of those free applications at home before course the class begins. For those students who absolutely cannot use a smartphone, you can use things like a Chromebook, a tablet for a lot of these. Like I sent you the Lincoln and the Bardo, you know, it's a, just a YouTube video <laughs> that you can scroll they call it WebGL is the interface that you can use to see 360 video, not in a headset. There's also, for those of you who have technology grants that you can apply to or have technology funding that you can apply to, um, there are a, a lot of really cool non-headset based VR immersions. There's actually inflatable geodomes. 
So you can get like an inflatable tent for a hundred dollars where all your students could be in the immersion together and you project the immersion on the wall, the immersions on the walls of the geodome. I mean, doesn't that kind of make you want to do it? <laughs> right? Like walking into an inflatable tent to be surrounded by these videos in 360 degrees. Um, there's uh, ways that you can set up three big monitors right around. So you basically create three walls out of large monitors to have the immersion for non-headset users um, for accessibility. Um, and almost all of the big companies, Google, HTC, HP, Microsoft, and Oculus, all have education discounts and plans and education grants and donation policies. Um, I've never paid full price for any of the equipment that I have because I reach out as an educator and say, here's how I'm using your materials. Um, and oftentimes they'll even say like, if you, you know, provide us with your assignments or provide us with some documentation of how your students are using them, we'll be happy to provide, you know, the, the equipment for you. Um, so definitely reach out. Um, I'd also, again, urge you to reach out to local educational technology companies, technology providers. If you have Verizon or Comcast or Microsoft or HP in your area, if you reach out, they will absolutely positively work with you. Because again, this is new content. It's emerging technology that's not widely adopted yet. They need you to be adopters for them to be successful. So they're going to make it happen for you. Other questions or we can jump to the chat. We have a nice robust discussion going on there. Anyone else? I see someone saying Oryx, uh, Oryx and Crake. And yes, I do teach Margaret Atwood's Oryx and Crake, um, which is absolutely about playing video games and about emerging technology and about cyborgs and questions of empathy. Um, I've, um, I've also taught uh, the year of the flood, which is in the same um, trilogy, and I've also I've, I taught an entire senior seminar on on Margaret Atwood. Um, I'm actually working on a, a book chapter on surveillance technologies in Margaret Atwood because I I think teaching Margaret Atwood's works really allow you to talk about the role of technology in our society, and students have really really interesting connections to their lives to to her work. Uh, thanks, Amanda, for all the information. Actually, I try to create some 3D experience like for my students. So it's end up like I bought a set of the headset for myself. But I was so, yeah, it was very cool experience. But the thing is, I have to put my cell phone within one feet. So after one hour, I'm totally dizzy. You know? like, oh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, so for me, I feel like my students are on those things every day already. If once a while, it could motivate them. But yeah, like you said, it's a balance. Otherwise, they're mentally destroyed. I feel like my fifth grader and also their eyes, whatever. So if like you, if they have some like a big monitor or not, a lot of that will be better for the students. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, it is definitely about balance, right? And we're talking about like a 10 minute immersion, not a several hour immersion here. And we're talking about one or two days of class where you're bringing this in, not every day of class. But I want to talk about dizziness for a minute. So I have really done exhaustive research here. And um, I want to talk about motion sickness. And this is the biggest like barrier to usability for VR specifically. So when you're on a boat <laughs> and you're um, in the cabin, when you're you know in the boat, not on the deck, you can't see the horizon and therefore you experience motion sickness because your body feels that it's moving, but your brain cannot see the movement happening. That's what causes that motion sickness. And this is from the scientific literature. This is not me making mumbo jumbo up here, okay? The same thing happens with VR. If your brain thinks you're moving because the screen is rotating in 360 degrees, but you are standing or sitting still, the same disconnect is happening. You have to, yourself and your students, you have to encourage movement and you have to use the sound and lighting cues to move with the VR experience. So if like you're in Lincoln in the Bardo and you hear a voice talking behind you, you have to physically turn your body to hear that voice. 
if you are in a Google expedition and you're climbing the pyramids, right? You have to physically walk and move with that immersion or you will experience motion sickness. This is why I recommend having chairs, rolling chairs or moving chairs for those who are not able to stand for long periods of time and why you want things like adjustable headsets. You can even make extendable straps with just pieces of fabric or Velcro for people who have um, glasses or larger hairstyles, right? That might not fit into a headset comfortably for a long time and to talk to your students through those decisions beforehand. You also absolutely can encourage students to bring those motion sickness bracelets that you would wear like on a boat <laughs> or take Dramamine if they experience, if they have like prescription motion sickness um, or sensory issues. There's also, you know, a lot of evidence that says good headsets that have good sound, right, will make a lot of difference. So you're not um, getting distracted by, by the sound not matching the video um, and things like that. I always make sure when I'm doing a workshop like this that I have everyone needs to be well hydrated and and you know maybe a snack <laughs> beforehand so your stomach is settled and you're well hydrated. I actually bring pregnancy candies, you know those little ginger candies that they market for for morning sickness. They're five dollars for a huge tub on Amazon, and it's somewhat of a placebo effect. But they if they can have the ginger candy in their mouth while they're doing the VR experience, it actually kind of cures like 99% of the perceived motion sickness, right? Because it grounds them, it gives them like a, a little shot of sugar and a little flavor in their mouth, um, but it works wonders. Um, and there's been more scientific studies about kind of how to mitigate the motion sickness, but for most people who don't have diagnosed sensory issues, it's really a matter of moving your body and drinking some water. Oh, oh, I see, yes, I like that students get been moving. If you actually play some of the great VR games like Beat Saber, it's a full body workout. This is a very physical exercise and it does get students up and moving. It's not just staring at your phone. You're walking around, you're looking at things, you're, you feel like you're outside of the classroom. It's a great way to have students travel to a new space or place when you can't actually take them to a new space or place. Um, I see that Megan Pike Bean has a question. Um, do you want to answer that one, Amanda? Uh, about the books I've named? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, so Ready Player One is perfect for the high school um, set. So Ready Player One is about a high school um, student, about a group of high school students, actually. The main character is, um, you know, a 16-year-old boy. Um, it takes place in a near future reality, I think 2024. Is the year, um, but a New Year future reality where climate change has basically decimated the United States of America. And because of that, virtual reality is a viable alternative to living in our, our actual environment. So the majority of students go to school in virtual reality and the school systems provide them with free headsets. And there's really big, important questions in this book about gender and identity in virtual spaces, about our debt culture and our debt economy, especially student loan debt and credit card debt. There's some really interesting questions in this novel about commercialization and the difference between an open access philosophy and a closed source philosophy. There's a lot of, um, I think, gender stereotypes that are broken down in interesting ways in the novel. Um, students are gonna love talking about catfishing. <laughs> Right. So if you represent yourself as a different gender age, right, um, or sexuality online, um, I actually have students when they read Ready Player One create avatars on just freeavatarmaker.com and think through how they would represent themselves if they went to school in virtual reality. Would they make their avatar look like them or would they make themselves a different race or gender and why? Really fun exercise. Um, and also they can kind of talk about the real world issues that cause people to have to live in virtual reality and how we might you know, prevent that if they don't want to live in virtual reality, if they don't want this to be their reality, if, they'd if they do have that technology fatigue, if they are sick of looking at their phones, how do we prevent our future from looking like the one that's in Ready Player One? There is also a Ready Player One VR game that I have students play and ask them to do better than that. It's the same, same exercise as the Frankenstein one. 
Oh, yes. For the person who said the audio book of Ready Player One is phenomenal. Will Wheaton is the narrator. And I actually play clips of the audiobook in my class. Um, I believe it's chapter three describes the, the classroom in virtual reality where, um, you know, the professor takes them on a field trip through the human heart and the professor of the high school is allowed to mute all the students and you're not, there's no bullying allowed because it's in virtual reality. And I play that chapter aloud in class using the audiobook, And it's a great way to like kind of really dissect that section of text. By the way, there is the application to fly through the human heart is real. Um, the uh, the de developer is called InMind and there's InMind is flying through the human brain. InCell is traveling a cell, through, you're on a cell traveling through the human body. They have all the different um, interesting scientific applications there. <laughs>